Saskia, uh, Richard, for helping pull this together. Um, the idea of theatrical space, particularly within my home discipline or in the social sciences, uh, is tied deeply to this idea of dramaturgical action. Um, the idea that activity in the world is often produced by the roles with it which we play. But this idea has kind of died in scholarship, I would say, over the last 10 years, in part because it's an incredibly static idea within my world. And part of the reason it's an incredibly static idea in my world is that when people say dramaturgical action, they don't know anything about theater or theatrical space. So they just like the idea of a role or a performance or the idea of a front stage and a backstage and then beyond that, it doesn't really do much work. Um, and so we're hoping today uh, to take the idea of theatrical space a little bit more seriously, to learn from it. Um, and we have a wonderful panel. I, I'm just going to fly through. So uh, we'll have Liz and then Daniel, Jonah, and then Andrew. And thank you all for being here. Friday afternoon, really? I'm sure everybody wants to go out to eat at some point. Um, so I'm, I'm, uh, we, our studio has done work, um, whoops, sorry. Oh yeah, good idea, that's useful. Okay, um, so uh, uh, my, my studio has done work for, uh, for the stage. We've also designed uh, stages ourselves and, and um, I just I thought to put together just a couple of things, maybe some uh, slightly alternative things um, that have been preoccupying us uh, recently, and maybe um, have something to do with one another. The um, the viewing platform. Um, this was um, a couple of weeks after 9/11. Uh, the the public had a compulsive urge to bear witness uh, to the World Trade Center site, uh, but no one was allowed past the barricades. Uh, which were blocks away from ground zero, so that vehicles in the recovery effort and the cleanup effort could work unobstructed. And out of a sense of civic responsibility, um, with no bureaucracy around to stop us because the city was fairly uh, disorganized and paralyzed, we built uh, this 300-foot-long ramp at Fulton Street uh, that, that rose up uh, 13 feet into the air um, as a viewing platform. And at the top of the platform um, uh, was, was a, basically a spot where the public could witness nothing. And um, uh, it was a kind of civic spectacle. Uh, we didn't produce anything other than just a means to observe. Um, we, we've had this, uh, this kind of great um, obsession with nothingness and a, a kind of uh, you know, uh, urge to look at nothingness. I think we live in such a media-saturated uh, world that, that seeing nothing is sometimes extremely powerful. Um, the, uh, a project that we're working on right now is, um, is an expansion for the Hirshhorn Museum, um, which is sited on uh, the most revered public space in America, the National Mall in DC. And the Hirshhorn is a museum, a museum of modern contemporary art. Um, and and it's, it's over on the right side of the mall, over there, the, the donut, uh, right in the middle. Um, the mall is a symbol of uh, American democracy, the symbol of American democracy. It's not a thing as a symbol, it's a space. Um, and it's a, it's a place where um, pivotal moments in the nation's history have taken place. Um, so the, the march on uh, jobs for wa uh, uh, the wa march, march on Washington for jobs and freedom, uh, the massive Vietnam uh, protests, the um, uh, commemor commemoration of those who died in in, uh, in the pandemic of AIDS, and um, uh, here the march on women's reproductive rights in '54. Uh, but there are many, many more like this. Um, the mall is a place where citizens can voice their discontent and show their power. Um, the, the mall is synonymous with, uh, with free speech, and, and this is um, very important um, in that uh, the mall is, um, is also a place that's surrounded by uh, a lot of museums, and there is a major disconnect between the communicative space of the mall and the mute museums that surround it. 
Um, there's a passive relationship between these museums and their audiences, and it's repeated each time the museum presents and the audience receives. Um, when Richard Koshalik took over the Hirshhorn in, um, in 2009, he was determined uh, to take advantage of the museum's unique location at the seat of power in DC. And while art and politics are implicitly connected, um, this particular site uh, at the Hirshhorn offered more potential uh, for uh, more explicit activities uh, in relationship to art and politics. Is it possible, for example, for art to insert itself into the dialogue of the national and world affairs? Could the museum be an agent of cultural diplomacy? And, and so on. Um, it's, uh, it's particularly a fertile place. There are over 180 uh, embassies in DC and 500 think tanks. Um, there should be a way for the museum to harness some of that uh, international brain trust. And why not expand the mission of the Hirshhorn beyond exhibiting modern and contemporary art to become a public forum on relevant issues in the arts, uh, culture, politics, and policy. For this new initiative, um, a space would have to be found um, in relationship to the structure. So this is the, the, the Hirshhorn. It's a 230-foot concrete donut. It was designed in the 70s by Gordon Bunshaft. Um, it's a hulking, silent, uh, cloistered, and arrogant type of building. Architects love to hate it. Um, uh, it's got some redeeming features, though. Um, it's, it's lifted up off the ground, and it's got a big hole in the middle. Um, looks kind of um, like a, some kind of weird um, FBI headquarters or something. But it, this is, uh, uh, strangely, if any of you have been there, the layout of exhibition shows is kind of co complex in, in this donut. Um, there's no space around this building to actually make this expansion for this new program. Um, so, um, except, of course, the whole. Um, the, what would the language of this space be? Um, it had to be a temporary, a temporary structure that would not just be there inert, but that would um, come and go every year seasonally. Um, but what would it be? The, the, uh, m the mall is surrounded by, uh, by uh, monumental institutions. Most are neoclassical, heavy and opaque, made of stone or concrete. Uh, Ada Louise Huxtable <laughs> called them the dinosaurs of American culture disposed to infinity. Um, anyway, the uh, material of choice for us was air. Um, it has to be made out of air. And, um, this is the, um, the model that we made for uh, uh, the director of the Hirshhorn to show him what we would do. Um, so for us, um, that space had to be light, it had to be ephemeral, it had to be formless and free, um, basically a big giant airbag. Um, but the, the big idea, the more poetic idea, was that the new structure would inhale the democratic air of the mall. Um, so that is um, basically the design. And um, uh, it's, it's basically, uh, so p part of it that doesn't fit is just squished out the side. Uh, it's made out of uh, translucent uh, silicone coated uh, glass fi uh, fiber fabric. Um, and uh, this is the cross section. So it's, yeah, it's kind of embarrassing sometimes to look at it in cross section, but uh, um, anyway, but this, this uh, it's, it's one contiguous air, kind of low pressure system. And, and, and what you see is that, that the constraining thing is, is, is just meant to sort of hold it in uh, when there's wind from kind of bouncing around the inner structure. Um, this is, uh, this is a point cloud. This is how we're calculating all the pressures all over. And I won't get into the specifics of this, but um, just to say it's, it's um, right now uh, going into a final phase of engineering. Um, the intention is really this. It's just to make a kind of forum, you know, a, a space for dialogue, and, and that's it. It doesn't have much more than that. It actually um, um, has been argued on the grounds that it kind of produces a dome uh, like the Capitol, and you'll see in a second. Um, but um, that's, that's the space. Um, so for us, this 
um, uh, this, this what has been dubbed as the bubble, um, is, a, is a place where form and content align. Um, and uh, the very first um, sessions will be ones of uh, cultural dialogue and diplomacy organized with the Council, of, uh, Council on Foreign Relations. Um, the bubble is an anti-monument. The ideals of participatory democracy are represented through suppleness rather than rigidity. Art and politics occupy an ambiguous site um, that's both outside and inside, extending the air of the mall into the museum's core. And uh, the bubble will open in, uh, in 2014. Uh, I'm going to move into a um, different project now, one that uh, you all might be familiar with. In 2002, we became part of one of the most unusual urban planning initiatives in New York, transforming the elevated, obsolete piece of New York infrastructure, the High Line, into a public park um, with field operations in Piet Udolf. Um, and I won't go too much into the design, um, I will only say that it was uh, it two thirds um, uh, or, or two sections out of three um, have been completed and the third one is in final design and actually started remediation right now. Um, um, we had in, in the uh, concept of, of, the, uh, uh, of the initial High Line, we were very inspired by what, what had about or by what had happened between 1980 and uh, like early 2000. Um, and the High Line fell into disuse with the um, advent of different forms of distributing um, industrial stuff and, and actually the transformation of the whole site. Um, and we were, we were kind of very inspired by what happened with these uh, micro environments that were uh, basically had formed and they were all self-seeded on this mile and a half long um, uh, stretch of this elevated th 30 feet up in the air. Um, so in different areas which received sun or shade or, or wet or dry or windy conditions or open and sheltered spaces or so forth produced a variety of different species um, that gradually thickened into a living mat. Um, and the High Line had evolved this strange flora and fauna uh, kind of microecology system with uh, over 100 types of plants that grew there. Um, and there was this sense of yielding of man-made into natural forces. Um, this was a piece of industrial archaeology after a radical time lapse. Um, and our, our, our mission really was to bring the public there without destroying this ecological balance. We wanted to re retain the sense of the cycles of, of um, kind of decay and rebirth that are there. Culture takes over nature, takes over culture, takes over nature. Um, and we wanted to keep that sense of melancholia that was there and a bit of nostalgia for a lost industrial culture. Um, anyway, a lot has changed. I'm just going to flip through um, a lot of, you know, some of these um, slides. There's very kind of simple vocabulary to it, reuse of uh, translation of some of this industrial um, uh, stuff into post-industrial kind of uh, lounging. Um, and these are some of the nicest images that are taken off the internet. Um, but it is this kind of weird place. Um, and um, a lot of some of these uh, spots are, are are starting to go now, and um, and these glass buildings are starting to come up like gra like like grass shoots. Um, but um, a High Line has been far more successful than we uh, could have ever imagined. The rate of gentrification uh, has come super super fast. Um, it was we. Uh, defended the High Line uh, when nobody wanted to, to save it on the grounds that it would be a catalyst uh, for development, but nobody really knew how much. Um, so uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's actually too much. It's starting to consume itself. Uh, but the High Line has also gone viral. There are High Lines proliferating all over the country and the world, this so-called High Line effect. And um, uh, in fact, um, as... Uh, um, uh, I, I want to kind of di diverge a little bit into um, something that's, that, that can't be copied, actually. There are 
there, um, and we're very happy that we've spawned this kind of interest in rethinking infrastructure. But there are some really, really special things that occur on the High Line. Uh, this was, the Standard Hotel was built there. Um, it was the first, it was the only one that kind of passed this, uh, was, was under the zoning uh, where you could build across uh, the High Line and, and they took advantage of it. Um, what happened um, sort of since is that, is that this has become a kind of a strange theater um, where these glass uh, uh, surfaces have become places where, um, of display and, uh, and kind of, so. <laughs> it's kind of, uh, anyway, understanding between an audience and, uh, and performers and um, uh, all sorts of things. This is the, uh, this uh, inadvertently a, a construction light was pointed at uh, one of this tenement apartment on the lower right, and it turned out that a cabaret singer lived there. So she used that light as a spotlight and came out to perform um, uh, every night at seven o'clock, and this was called the Renegade Cabaret. And um, a lot of stuff has happened that we could have never um, predicted, and that continues to happen and flourish at the, at the High Line. Um, so the High Line is, is really impossible to replicate. Um, it, it is a collision of all that's unintended and, and unimagined um, in the future. This accidental ecosystem that we found at the beginning of the project um, spawned into a new ecosystem in which natives, tourists, artists, executives, socialites, club kids, cruisers, retirees, sunbathers, fitness buffs, fashionistas, and even flashers produce a new biodiversity that is um, exceptionally New York. Um, urban parks are typically an escape from the city. You go to the High Line, though, to re-enter New York, but it's unconscious. The imperfect, the overlooked, the blank party walls and innards of buildings, the loading docks and chop shops at arm's distance from cars parked up in the air on mechanical lifts next to fire escapes and smokestacks floating at the height of giant underwear ads, um, often called the underwear gods, um, even as the condos go up, the High Line will always refuse to fit neat neatly into the logics of the city. And um, it's right now in this kind of weird, um, fragile balance. Um, this is um, one of the 10th Avenue Spur um, that we simply opened up and kind of produced a uh, grandstand there to look onto the traffic of 10th Avenue. Um, ultimately, uh, I think that the, the success of the High Line is, is very local, it's very much about New York. And it has to do with introducing New Yorkers to the concept of doing nothing. Um, if we're not in our offices being productive, we're at the gym burning calories, or at the park walking our dogs, or between these points consulting our devices. The High Line doesn't offer much to do. Well, you can walk, or you can sit, or you can watch people, or you can look at one of the walls, or you can look at taillights. Um, and it's very much about um, the kind of spectacle of nothingness, like staring blankly into a fireplace or a lava lamp. Um, very Seinfeld. And I'm going to stop there because my time is up. Thank you. to bring this presentation up. Uh, my name is Daniel Arsham. I am a visual artist, although my work often engages um, architecture in ways that cause it to perform in unexpected ways, do things that it's not supposed to do, um, and often does so in ways that kind of obey the logic of surfaces. So they cause these surfaces to stretch or uh, fold or melt or ripple. Um, and the theatricality of this work sort of accidentally led, to, uh, led me to working in theater sort of by accident, and I'll get to that a little bit later in the presentation. 
but oftentimes when people um, approach this work, they are struck by its, um, its ability to kind of manipulate a surface that we all have expectations about. So we have uh, expectations that these surfaces cannot function in this way. They, they're solid, they have a kind of um, logic that should perform in certain ways. Um, and I'm often sort of trying to find other languages that I can integrate and um, sort of borrow. The kind of idea of a figure interacting um, with the work is something that has been prominent for the last number of years in these types of pieces. And um, it was pointed out to me recently that when you're in a museum or a gallery, you're sort of presented with a scenario where you're not really supposed to touch things. And we are allowed to touch architecture, walls, um, floors, columns, although we don't often touch them. Um, and there's a sort of question that can arise in these works that are seamless with the architecture. At what point uh, does the work stop becoming architecture and start to become this other um, object? And these sort of codes of um, uh, behavior that occur within museums and uh, galleries sort of set up a base condition, um, even though nobody obeys that because these works often have fingerprints all over them uh, afterward. Oftentimes these works are made in a way that this, there's a slight scale shift or there may be um, the kind of uh, gesture that causes people to sort of question their relationship to these forms. Um, so this brings us to this uh, performative work that I've done. Uh, in about 2006, I was contacted sort of out of the blue um, by a choreographer named Merce Cunningham. And he uh, had a way of working in which he would separate his uh, dances into three separate components. So you would have his choreography, uh, the stage design, and the score, or the music. Um, although he sort of borrowed uh, or used John Cage's ideas about chance to separate those three into independent uh, qualities. So when I worked with him, I didn't know what he was doing, and I didn't know what the music would be. So I would create the scenography, the choreographer would create the dance, and the musician would create the score. All three of these coming together um, uh, to create an evening. In much of that work, I um, often found it exhilarating but slightly frustrating in that I was never able to make things that directly interacted with the dancers because I didn't know what the uh, performance was going to be. I wasn't able to allow the sculptures or the physical objects that I was making to directly engage with the performers. Uh, Jonah Bocaire, who we'll speak later, was a dancer in Merce's company when I met him and we have begun to collaborate on pieces that sort of allow us to physically engage um, these set materials. I think these slides might be out of order, but... Getting back to um, another performance work that I did with Mercer's company, this was a stage design for the final performances of Mercer's company at the Park Avenue Armory uh, at the end of last year. And when we, or one of the sort of fascinating things for me in working in theater was that the audience was a, had a sort of fixed position. So when we think about how audiences engage with artworks in a museum or a gallery, they're able to obviously walk around these things and engage with them, see the backs of them, um, touch them. And in theatrical space, the audience is in a fixed position and we're able to sort of play all of these tricks. Merce often worked uh, 
in sort of non-traditional theatrical venues where uh, these sorts of codes were not particularly set up. Um, and I often was fascinated with this idea of engaging vertical space. So in much of the work that um, a, choreogra a choreographer can make in stage, the dancers are moving left to right and back and forth. Um, and there is this vertical sort of space that's able to be engaged. These works physically were based on images of clouds um, that were taken on tour while I was with Merce's company over a number of years. The images being blown up and uh, individual uh, color samples from the pixels being uh, painted onto these spheres and then the image is reconstructed. A lot of this sort of work with Merce led me to this interest in theatricality um, and how I might be able to allow <clears throat> um, audiences to sort of participate or visualize the way that some of these things were uh, being created. This is a project that I did at Storefront for Art and Architecture, which is a small venue uh, downtown that has these apertures on the exterior of the building um, that allow the doors to kind of rotate open and there sort of creates a space that there's no interior exterior. And often when we think about um, creating space, we think about this additive process of building walls and the ceiling and floors and sort of defining a volume through that. This project uh, took a uh, sort of subtractive approach. So we filled the entire uh, venue solid with this dense um, styrofoam and then over the course of the exhibition I was excavating out this material. Um, the apertures that were protruding out onto the street were open so that um, these sort of windows to the street were uh, open so the audience could see in. There you sort of have a view. We also created a scenario where um, these original doorways that swing open um, could have a kind of functional purpose in excavating the space themselves. So this one uh, almost appeared to have sliced through like a cheese grater uh, and sort of pushed this material back out onto the street, uh, bringing the interior to the exterior. Um, and I'll sort of end with this project, which uh, is a recent artwork that was created in Miami. And this was on the site of um, the old Miami Orange Bowl Stadium, which was important um, to that community, both uh, as a sort of nostalgic um, sports venue, uh, but also historically um, with many sort of cultural events, presidents speaking there um, and rallies occurring. And the building was destroyed. It was very sort of controversial within the community and a new stadium was built on its existing site. Um, I submitted a proposal to create a sort of commemorative marker um, that would mark the, the existence of the old stadium but do so in a way that caused this sort of new um, possibility. So taking this destructive act and sort of generating a new possibility and what was done was a recreation of the original Miami Orange Bowl sign, which was on the exterior of the building. And it was recreated in its original scale as if all of the letters had sort of fallen off and lodged themselves into the ground at various angles, um, allowing people to sort of interact with this thing that was obviously in a different height, different space, uh, and, and physically engage with it. biggest uh, sort of challenge in thinking about some of these projects is the ability for them to uh, pass building code. So the ADA compliance officer at the Miami-Dade Department of Buildings was 
worked with us, uh, but was very challenging to sort of figure out there are these very specific rules about uh, how these things can function in space. Their angle, um, their position uh, within stairwells and uh, staircases. Uh, but we were able to sort of manipulate these rules or um, find the logic within them to uh, allow these things to function there. Thank you. Hi there, good afternoon, uh, good, good early evening. Uh, my name is Jonah Boker. I'm a choreographer and media artist. And I, I thought I'd start with a secret, um, which is that I'm a very nervous public speaker. Um, so I'd like to begin with two interventions, but, but prior to that, um, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, today, um, Teatro Mundi, the initiative, uh, Randall Borscheidt, uh, Dominique Bagnato and also the hosts here at Columbia. Um, so as a choreographer, what I thought we could do is um, I'd like to, today I'd like to focus in, in terms of these themes which have been discussed uh, at great length this afternoon and also along with our colleagues. What I'd like to zoom in on is um, distribution and also I, I guess I would say iteration. Of, uh, of, of theater in all of its forms. What I'd like to do, and maybe we could start by performing kind of an act or a contract of trust. Um, I'm going to distribute this choreography which is called Fifth Wall. It's actually an iPad app, and what it does is it, um, you can scale its determinacy and its order, uh, but this was all a little bit of a ploy so that you could sort of touch me or touch the dance. So. I'd like to distribute this, so the trust is, I know it's cold season and everything's coming on, but we're going to pass around the iPad and I assume it'll uh, be here at 6 p.m. afterwards, so <laughs> I'm, sure you're, I'm sure you're under surveillance, but um, so we'll pass this around so you can kind of choreograph things as we go. Um, and in contemplating a little bit of the, the prompt along with our colleagues here, I was um, I thought, you know, there's so much to share, especially I, th I think we have um, an incredibly rich potential dialogue of, um, 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 among the four panelists. One is that Daniel and I have worked together, I think, for about six years, have enormous respect for everyone here. I think Andrew was able to see some live work a, a few months ago, so hoping the dialogue will be lively. Um, the, uh, a few things that struck me when I walked into this room um, I'm in the practice of, of theater and rearranging space, bodies in space. I noticed the ten stairs leading down to this um, uh, to this space. I noticed the four microphones, the DLP projector, the two red exit signs. The screen struck me as a little bit sinusoidal on the sides, um, but very good, very sharp quality of projection. This kind of glow on the table I found so <laughs> bizarre. Um, but, uh, but, also, but also very good quality of sound and uh, good coffee, um, very collegial and at times very heated dialogue. So all of this seemed to have fantastic grammar for uh, deliberating about theater. Um, and then I, using a chance method that Daniel and I have worked with in the past, came up with the number 40 this morning, so I have 40 pictures to kind of illustrate with you. And I think that they're going to shuffle in some way. Um, but this space, anyway, it's a pleasure to share this space with you. And as Fifth Wall is passing around, um, we'll look at this wall. Um, we'll start with a slide called, uh, of a piece called Replica from 2009. This is a collaboration with designer Daniel Arsham. Um, Replica is a choreographic duet which was designed to be able to be reconfigured in any space as long as the space could offer 25 by 25 square feet to its, uh, to its two performers. Daniel actually intervened in the stage 
by proposing a stage which was dominated by a large white cube, square center. Um, and the, the way that I responded to that was, in addition to choreographing the dance, I decided to... Oh, great. Oh, good, okay, dual screen. Uh, I decided to propose to Daniel that his scenic design also be considered perhaps a screen of its own, um, and that we might engage with a double presence for this duet. Uh, not only shadows of the figures, but also projections as well. Um, so in this work, there's really a duet between two dancers, but also a duet between, I would say, a choreographer and a designer, and also between the figures and their own shadows. Uh, so these forms of duets tend to tunnel through each other. Um, and what I found interesting at this point in the collaboration with Daniel was he also decided to take away the possibility of exits. Um, so any entrances or exits inside of this theatrical space proposed by Daniel would happen from within the scenography. Um, what I found as a choreographer is that this created a certain vacuum of space by which um, entrances and exits for the two figures were motivated from within uh, the cubic space. Um, we then, as the piece began iterating, I think it was performed, or it, it, Replica has iterated in, I think, 37 different spaces. We began to project past performances of the work onto the walls of the cube, so bringing other spaces um, in which the piece had been performed onto the scenography as a, as a form of screen. Um, the, the other thing which Daniel proposed, and we allowed a, a great space for him to do that, Daniel proposed that all scenographic actions occur not through the magic of theater, but by his own hand uh, performed on stage. So rather than suspending the disbelief of the public or coming up with a smart or theatrically savvy way of creating scenographic action, Daniel busted the walls with his own hands each night. And then he would refabricate or replaster the walls. So what this then led to in the collaboration was yet a fifth or a, a, I think a sixth duet, which was then Daniel performing the scenographic changes and then myself playing sort of a directorial role in terms of his blocking as a performer. Um, we then tried to double the work still further by bisecting each of the walls and mirroring uh, the video imagery. So this, this image here is of the two walls carrying uh, two projections and four images of the duet. So there are, uh, there are eight figures then dancing with the dancers. Um, replica continues to be performed and another sort of iteration that's been happening is we've had casting changes as well. Uh, the original performer was uh, a, one, a marvelous performer named Judith Sanchez Ruiz, um, a very gifted performer, Trisha Brown dancer, um, originally born in Cuba. Uh, the work has now been restaged and reimagined by a new interpreter uh, named Chun Sen Cheng. Uh, originally from Taiwan. So now the choreography has actually taken on, I would say, a very different life um, with different performers. Um, the, the other thing which I think uh, is worth mentioning is in all of these collaborations, Daniel also plays a heavy role in uh, lighting design and in the fullness of how not only scenography, but also the bodies are represented graphically in space through light. Um, the, what we're looking at here is an example of backlight through which actually he sculpturally installs lights behind uh, the set design, which then have the possibility of glowing or, uh, or forming additional shadows. Still further, uh, the piece then began to be invited to be performed in still 
a little bit more untraditional venues. Um, this is in two th July of 2009 in which uh, the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council's outdoor festival called Sightlines uh, invited the work to be restaged or reimagined. What I found interesting was Daniel located the, um, really a, a longitudinal axis along, along which to orient the work and the corner itself. Uh, and in response to that, I then began to talk with the producers of this work about the time of day at which the production would be performed. So we chose 11 a.m. because the shadows, um, actually sunlight, began to phase along uh, several different vectors of, of the street at that time. So you can sort of see uh, the two walls being eclipsed here. Um, and then, of course, another thing that, uh, just because we're quickly heading into a different paradigm, which is outdoor performance, the, um, the role of, of the performative work changes when sort of unsuspecting uh, viewers or, or participants, you could say, are, are looking at the, at the production. We would then have sort of FedEx trucks and um, food vendors and whatnot uh, doing what one would do in this part of New York at the time, during the show. The ephemera of the, of the broken walls remained kind of as a, as I would say, uh, as, a, as a public sculpture afterwards. Um, we then had subsequent performances at 6 p.m. in very different lighting. Um, so this is, these are a few of the iterations of the work replica. Um, an overview of some other collaborations. One thing that, we've talked a lot about walls so far, and I think fifth, fifth wall, I still see it being passed around. Um, questioning the role of the floor on stage uh, is something that we've been exploring lately. Um, in 2011, Daniel proposed a, a scenography just of a 12-foot roll of photographic paper, um, by which we began to explore a solo called Recess. The parameter that I responded with choreographically was that the body then only navigates um, on top of the paper and never comes into contact with the theatrical surface sort of as a constraint. The body is then swallowed by the sonography, uh, producing sort of a performative sculpture and changing the figure itself. Um, and then just to keep in sort of our squadratic logic or, or non-logic, um, a work called Why Patterns uh, premiered in Rotterdam in 2010, in which Daniel inscribed an artificial square on the space. And we began to, I then treated this square sort of as a playing field for choreography um, and invited three scenic interventions from Daniel. One was a large deluge of ping pong balls, which cascaded onto the performers or the players. Um, and the choreography then iterates, I'll just go quickly, because uh, I, th I think we're close to out of time. The choreography then iterates into a sort of a treacherous um, performance space for the, for the performers. I think it was 10,000 ping pong balls upon which the performers navigate um, and perform. So there's a lot of, um, there are different tasks which occur choreographically, raking, vacuuming, um, evacuating the, the square itself, and eventually taking apart the imposed square on the stage. So quickly what I think, and I'll, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think that what we're starting to graph out together in terms of theater is using the design elements sort of as the fundamental principle for organizing choreography, which Daniel spoke briefly about the Cage Cunningham legacy, but the independence of um, contributing elements in, in a work. Um, I'm now starting a little bit of research on how to invert that and how to create interdependent, uh, rather inseparable uh, elements, which fuse. Um, quickly, uh, I, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll go quickly, the, um, I wanted to share a work which comes from a very different uh, frame of reference, but also introducing the idea, perhaps, that visual art could be used as a structural support 
for organizing choreography. Um, and when I say structural support, I mean in both senses of the word, formally, but also uh, in terms of human support as well. The, um, in 2011, I was uh, commissioned by the Guggenheim Museum to create a work responding to Lee Ufan's uh, uh, monument called Dialogue. And this was approached as sort of an act of, rather than writing a new choreography, more, in, more of an act of supplication, I would say, with the existing work. The work has two sources, one being the sculpture itself, and the other being um, a work uh, with actually very little ephemera at all that remain. It was a 1967 work called Things and Words, by which the artist performed the act of pinning paper to the ground and then exposed the remains in a museum. So the artist actually invited me to uh, reimagine what his actions were, and he had only this photograph. So with that sort of permission, we then, be, uh, we then entered a long session. I, I think that uh, Seamus very helpfully mentioned dramaturgy right at the beginning of his, uh, of, of his welcome. So how to reimagine and yet how to choreograph something that you, you didn't see and by which there's very little uh, source material. Um, so I wanted to mention this as well. This was a work called On Vanishing, uh, performed site specifically and which actually does, does not iterate, um, partly because of the site specific nature of the work. Um, working with visual artists to script choreography is something that I'm working more and more with now. Um, and what this quickly leads to is, spa uh, is space which is not imagined as a stage, but sometimes a space within a space. Um, the, uh, there's, there's much more, but I'd like to leave it at that. And the, um, actually, I think the, the other thing, and forgive me, if you look very closely, you can see uh, Randall Borscheid in the... <laughs> In the, in the public as well. So anyway, I wanted to wink to you and thank you again for organizing this as well. Hello, it's a, it's a fairly tough gig to be the last speaker up on a day as rich and as diverse and as thrilling as today's been. And I want to thank you Saskia and the temporarily absent Richard for engineering this collision, this extraordinary collision, uh, talking about uh, certain kinds of life force, certain kinds of energy which occur naturally or creatively and the forms of buildings, uh, of cities, and of regions which serve more or less well to accommodate and give a support to those energies. Um, I, I'm going to try, if it's possible, to sort of cover some of the arc of the subjects that we've talked about today, but really getting back to what it says on, on the tin of our organization by talking about the theater as a paradigm, um, as a tool of social investigation, um, I'd like to first of all, really recognize uh, my co-panelists for their inspiring work, particularly Liz, the fact that uh, in an age of very, very loud architecture, we can say performing architecture, where people are struggling for attention and space, uh, you've created something, particularly in the High Line, which is just a revelatory device, really. It's extremely ordinary, um, but I think, you know, its popularity and its success is a testament to the fact that uh, people actually need this. People actually need just to be sort of... Uh, put gently into the position of spectator and have their, have their ordinary world revealed to them in a certain way. It's incredibly powerful. And I want to thank you guys for the performance that uh, I saw in the Avignon Festival, where contrary to many of the touring shows that uh, you see in that context, uh, which are just sort of transplants, uh, touring shows which are shoehorned into strange venues, you actually engaged, you, you, you touched the fabric of the school courtyard that you worked in. Daniel created a rather strange uh, non-Newtonian goop which uh, poured out of an upper window of this school and <clears throat> made a rather messy pool on the stage at a certain point. 
And then Jonah actually sort of moved around and engaged with a, a statue of the Virgin Mary, which was in the courtyard. Uh, and this was, a, this was a very, and I can see much better now actually where that comes from in terms of your work. And I'll be talking about we, what we could say, in a sense, is some of our common heritage. Now, looking around the room, seeing so many of you staring at devices and looking awfully tired at the end of a long day, um, I just want to say that uh, it's midnight for my body clock, and I, I want your help. Um, so could we have the lights on, please? I want to perform, I want you to perform, a democratic exercise. And if you wouldn't mind just putting your computers down, <coughs> Um, wrap up warm if you need to still. Could you all please stand up? <clears throat> I what I want you to do is something which is extremely simple as a movement, but actually, as I think you'll discover, a bit more subtle and complicated as a, as a group democratic exercise. I'd like you to remain standing for a little bit, and I'd like you to try and decide collectively, to sit down together. <laughs> that would indeed be a challenge. Yes. <coughs> I, I call that more of a monarchy than a democracy. <coughs> uh, where's my zapper? Mm -hmm. Do, we have, do I have the pointer? I want to be Happy running to around here. Now, I just want to thank you, compliment you, um, and let you know that you've just performed in a piece directed by this man, Peter Brook. This is an exercise which he often uses to warm up an audience in a lecture. Um, Peter is uh, someone I've worked with for a long time, um, and he is of uh, the same generation as most Cunningham. Cunningham. They, were, they were friends. I think there, there are many shared patterns of thought, and I think it's rather interesting that there is a sort of generational leap or loop that's occurring with certain artists of our generation. Um, I want to talk about Peter's work for many reasons related to, to what we've been saying throughout the day, Saskia. Um, this is just a small selection of books by and about Peter Brook. I'm assuming most of you know who he is, so really the leading theatre director and thinker on the theatre of the, at least the last 50 years. Um, you can see just detached on the top right, The Open Circle, which is a book that he and I wrote together about the question of space for performance. And on the bottom right, his book uh, written in 1967, 1968, it's again funny how that date keeps coming around these days, uh, The Empty Space, which was a a fairly aggressive calling into question of space for culture, space for, for free speech, space for gathering. And I just want to explain a little bit of sort of Peter's arc throughout that time, as we document it in our book, and, and start really with the street. Because what happened, like so many artists working in the late 60s, um, Peter went through a process of rejection. Uh, he said, you know, theatre in its conventional form has no meaning any longer, so we have to actually destroy it, move away from it, and uh, see how we can make something again. And um, one of the first exercises which he developed over a period of about four years was uh, performing without architecture. This is actually a little bit later, but this, as you can see, is an improvisation in front of a bus terminal. It's in Mestre, just outside of Venice. And this company went around the world in various contexts, just seeing how they could actually redefine the, the conditions of uh, communication and encounter between people. Now, as you can see here, this presents immediately a few, a few difficulties. Uh, as you can see in this kind of freeform context here, there's only about the first two or three rows of people who can see anything. You can imagine you know, the diesel engine of that bus revving up. Uh, the quality of oral communication, the quality of concentration of, of subtle messages which uh, a performer could pass to an audience is also rather hampered by the, the freeform nature of this environment, even though obviously uh, it's stimulating in other respects. Um, he carried out other experiments. Here you can see Sasuke in the Global South. Um, this is uh, a similar sort of itinerant experiment uh, he carried out in 1974. This is somewhere in the Sahel, but he basically went from Algeria down through West Africa, where the only scenographic tool which he had, if this looks familiar to you guys, uh, was a, a large piece of tissue. Uh, it was uh, essentially a blue carpet which became 
a locus, a piazza, if you like, a, an, in, an invasive object which was unrolled in many villages where, in certain circumstances, the people had never seen a Westerner before, let alone Helen Mirren, who you see here. Um, now, this experimental process allowed them to discover several things. Um, one was that it's actually possible with a certain language, and this is much closer to choreography, I think, than theatre. Um, obviously, they weren't using sort of words to communicate. Helen Mirren was just about to put on these magic boots which had transformative power over her. Um, but they also discovered that one of the essential things to actually really give force to the communication in an act of theatre is to unbalance, not to actually say that it's a democracy of equals, but it's actually it's a, it's a sort of a, a compact or, or a convention of unequal characteristics, a group of people who are prepared to tell a story, to come into a given environment, and a group of people who are prepared rather randomly by their everyday lives to, to gather and to receive this. They also discovered another very important thing, which was that in this context it was very, very helpful to detach the human body to actually give a status to the performer, to, to detach it against a wall or a given background. They obviously worked this experiment out hundreds of times in different contexts. Now, what Pete has done over the course of 40 years since then is work not with the tools which he, he sort of uh, was ascribed to by power, but actually with the tools which he, he apprehended for himself um, in a very politically interesting manner with the help of that gentleman sitting in the fifth row there in one case, which we're about to see. Um, and made space, like a piece of clothing, around the kind of conditions and gathering which is inherent in the act of theatre and uh, the question of telling a story as he saw it. This is his theatre in Paris, the Bouffe du Nord, as he discovered it, as a ruin. He didn't actually do that much to it. Here you can see various scenographies, again, working only with the floor, not changing the fabric of the building at all. This is Marbarata, getting something from the Global South. Um, the wall is the real wall of the theatre. The colours have perhaps been changed a little bit over time, but it's the real historical fabric. It has the real depth of time into it, and the scenography is built off that. This is the Tempest. It's an island. Uh, this has proved a very, very successful kind of chameleon space to, to form all kinds of environments from uh, the late 19th century Russia of the cherry orchard to the sort of abstract island of the Tempest to a doctor's surgery in the man who. And here's a few more images of the space with scenography from a couple of years of the magic flute. It's bamboo there. We'll come back to bamboo. There's bamboo in the previous slide as well. Now, um, <clears throat> this building is a sort of uh, love child or export of the Bouffe du Nord idea. It's uh, just, over the, just over the way in Brooklyn. It was an abandoned music hall, music hall called uh, the Majestic, which nobody wanted. Uh, it was full of asbestos. It was leaking. It was falling into disrepair. Peter said, well, I can't find anywhere in New York. I visited nearly 300 theatres. Uh, this is the only space which seems to have any real poetry. Can we transform it for a three-week run of the Mahabharata? And uh, Randall Borscheidt, sitting over there, who was the Deputy Cultural Commissioner of the City of New York at the time, <coughs> wrote a cheque for $4 million, um, <coughs> perhaps somewhat <laughs> over and above the wishes of his superiors. Um, and lo, the Harvey was born. It was actually, you know, again, it's this kind of risk, this impulse... Um, perhaps uh, anti-democratic thought, uh, which has allowed this space to become an extremely important venue, I think, on the New York cultural scene, a 900-seat venue which doesn't have a fixed stage, which is uh, perfect for certain kinds of contemporary music, dance, theatre performance, uh, and Peter still continues to come back there. These are a few other examples of spaces that he's sort of spawned or sponsored. This is Avignon Festival again. This is the Bourbon Quarry, where the Marabrata was inaugurated. This was... Uh, this is the Odeon in Pompeii, which was the f first use of this theatre for performance in 2,000 years, and a cloister in Lisbon for the Conference of the Birds. This is another image of the Mahabharata. Now, I'm going to show three examples, which are essentially from the work of my practice. I'm an, I'm an architect specialising in theatre, showing in a, a little way what we, you know, what we took away from the, con the still ongoing conversation with Peter. Um, and then also, I actually want to put some food on the table, which we might be able to share and uh, chop up and cook together. Uh, I think that's one of the challenges of this network. We're not, just here, we're not just here to talk. I think there's enough creative energy and intelligence in this room that we can actually work proactively on given projects. And I'm going to present three cases from my own work, concluding with one which is, is just beginning and can be shaped uh, quite significantly still. This is, as it was, the Young Vic Theatre in London, um, which we transformed with Howard Tompkins Architects. I won't tell you the whole story, but it's a rather interesting... Again, 1968, experimental theatre building, 
which was literally falling down. It was built for a short lifespan. Um, we just sort of wrapped it and cocooned it and supported it. But perhaps the most important thing about the building, it's an important locus of memory. You can see it's in a fairly tough streetscape. Um, this is not a million miles away from Peckham that we were looking at earlier in the day with Ricky. Um, another important aspect of this space is that the site clearance was done free of charge by the Luftwaffe in 1941. Um, and the only <laughs> remaining building <coughs> is this rather strange house you can see in the composition here, which was Wilson Brothers Butcher Shop, which obviously we decided to keep in uh, the, the redeveloped Young Vic. Um, you see some images of the exterior here. The real challenge here, and hopefully... We'll just get to, you can see the auditorium. Um, you can see the sort of archaeology that we encountered uh, uncovering this slab, which has bodies and most likely also unexploded, unexploded bombs underneath it. I'll just show you a film at this stage. Here's a studio theater, which the film, once you start it up, um, goes literally from, oops, oh, it's on that slide there, goes from street to stage to street. What was quite important for us in redeveloping this building was um, keeping alive the very delicate relationship between this rather marginal community with a great range of sort of ethnic and social mixes and this auditorium which we thought of much more as a, as a civic place rather than a space for scenographic representation. Are we having trouble with the film? Um, I think you got the idea from the slides anyway. We tried to replicate and keep some of the sense, here we go, um, of the toughness of the street, the utilitarian quality of its details, designing the perhaps slightly ugly brickwork that's there, the ordinariness of it, and carry that through to the inside so that it wouldn't just be a space of show, it would be a space that was somehow in continuity. This is a laser scan of the actual finished building, uh, which was done this summer. So here you can see coming into the foyer, it's also a very low-cost building. I think this is an important point to make. So we made very, very direct decisions about finishes. And here you can see, coming into the main auditorium, and hopefully you get some kind of sense of that, uh, the belonging to its, to its place. And not just its place, but also the, the, you know, the kind of cursus, the, the time and the history of its place, and the way it's actually rooted in a certain community and in a certain set of memories. It's a very flexible auditorium. This is just one aspect of it. It's rebuilt for almost every show. And when I say rebuilt, it's really rebuilt. We made it much more flexible than it was before. Almost everything you can see here can be unbolted and taken down. It was used by Peter Brook. We thought of him a lot. He was a sort of godfather to the project. And the first time he performed in there, I was called in rather urgently because he was desperately unhappy with it. Um, <coughs> and said, no, 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 it's terrible. And there's nothing right. The relations are all wrong. We realized that actually what was quite wrong with it was... Uh, was his openness. He was trying to play in it without building anything or doing anything, but he just sort of messed the space up slightly, moved a few things around, made it look like it was sort of in progress somehow, a bit like a Zen gardener just uh, leaving the trace of the rake, and then it was perfect. Um, now, I want to share with you now, once we go back to the slides, two things of immediate potential import for our group. One minute, blimey. Um, <clears throat> um, this is... We're racing through the presentation, I can see here. This is a dumb box, um, which is a potential Teatro Mundi box. The idea being you can put it anywhere, you can open it to its context, you can perform in it as a closed focus space, or you can perform outwards onto the city. It's just a kind of scaffolding or an invading force, which is qualitatively a little bit different than a circus tent, but obviously not quite as high spec as a finished cultural building. And one advantage to that is that it costs $70,000 to uh, procure and put up in a given place. And I want to conclude, it might take a little bit more than a minute, um, with a, a project which is much richer, I think, in its implications, because it involves a whole town, and it's a rather beautiful generational arc. This is Peter's daughter, Irina, uh, who is an extremely important theatre director in her own right, working in a very different way to her father, um, working here in the United States to a certain extent, and now, um, this is, uh, this is her company, who are, this is the sort of a steering committee for the project that we're working on right now. <coughs> um, they're dressed up as trolls in their recent performance of Pia Gint at the Salzburg Festival, which will be coming to La Mama uh, fairly shortly here. You can get some idea of her sort of uh, theatrical world here. 
Um, and this is the place where the political power, the mayor of this town, Risa Rangis, which is uh, not a well-known town apart from having been the lifelong home of Jacques Derrida. It's about half an hour south of Paris on public transport. And he's taken the extremely bold decision of saying, well, here he is, Thierry Mondon, who's a rising star in uh, the left in France. He's an extremely intelligent, dynamic man. He's also now a member of parliament. Um, and here you can see him, this is a site visit. There's him and Irina kind of crouching in the mud, uh, wondering what the hell we're gonna do next. And instead of actually taking the street and trying to add culture as a, you know, a sort of sweetener or the icing on the cake, he's actually starting with culture. He's saying, I don't want culture as uh, a sort of impersonal municipal thing which is there to make people better. I want it to be personal. And he's actually invited Irina to come into, this is some images from the local town. This is a car boot sale a couple of weeks ago. Uh, obviously socially fairly low scale, ethnically mixed, very lively, very dynamic. Also has a rather beautiful site, this is the River Seine, and a series of industrial buildings along the side of the site which are being developed into a new neighborhood, but we'll actually be going in there first. Now I hope we'll be doing a lighting experiment with Suzanne um, on one of these industrial spaces, I'll show you in just a second. A um, little bit of a reference and try and recall the Renaissance origins of our discussions here. This is Shakespeare's two theatres. It's actually the Rose on the right and the Globe on the left, on the left bank of London, very close to the Young Vic. Um, I just wanted to point out the sort of ordinary, extraordinary character of these two buildings. They, they, they're in their context, but they stand out from it at the same time. They're sort of revelatory devices, if you like, but they're not big palaces of culture which are cut off from their surroundings. Um, and there's something about inherent in that, I think, in the writing of Shakespeare. Um, now, you'll see where I'm showing this in just a moment. Here's the town, there's the site. Um, again, nothing there, two circus tents on the top, one of which is used by Daniel Buren. Uh, this is not another High Line. Um, this is <coughs> a rather nice industrial building by Fresinet. There are actually a pair of them, which we were given initially to look at for this project. Um, we will be performing Pier Gint in this building. We will be keeping some of the graffiti. You're invited next March. Uh, and I hope that we'll be running a kind of Teatro Mundi experiment in there as well, and a meeting. Um, this is another space slightly smaller. There's me and Irina and my dog on a site visit. Uh, we'll, be perform we'll be transforming those spaces in a very, very minimal way. And you can see this kind of emerged quite organically from the conversation, but you can see a big, strange round thing parked in the river there. Um, which is what we realized we, we actually needed something quite special to, to make this formula work, to actually make the sort of civic links which uh, we were all looking for. And this is what it is. It's a, it's a very, very simple pragmatic theater made out of uh, structural timber and bamboo with natural light of various kinds and transformed by a big umbrella to give darkness. It's Shakespearean in spirit in terms of the simplicity of the building, also basically off-grid independent in energy, um, bioclimatic envelope which changes with the seasons and turbines in the river to generate just about enough energy for the lead lighting system. Um, early days, obviously. Now, it was sort of plonked on a vaguely earthbound site, but it's actually ended up here on the edge of the river um, because it, partly because uh, it's a wonderful place to put it and partly also because it took us out of certain civic questions of other sites. It, it sort of freed them up. So this is going to be sort of rolling and happening. We have the ear of the people in political power there. They're aware of what we're doing. And it's very nice to be able to say this kind of as, as the last word as, a, as an individual speaker today. It's over to you. I think you know, this is an open door for your participation, for your ideas and your energy to actually look at a real case of how a town can be transformed by its cultural life. Thank you very much. Um, I won't take any chair's prerogative of asking questions, but if uh, the panelists wanted to ask of one another before I open it up, I thought I would at least allow that. No? Is, is that associated with the... Oh, sorry. Is that a uh, site associated with Teatro Mundi, or is it... Uh, yes. Okay. Um, in as much as Irina is sort of part of our 
generally informal and friendly network and is aware of what we're doing and the kind of attention that we can bring from a transdisciplinary and a sociological perspective uh, just to really kind of support the project, not to intervene in any hard way, but we've got people thinking about sound. I've got to mention that Paul Gilleron is a project acoustician. Um, you know, Suzanne Setinger, who spoke this morning, uh, is involved on experiments about urban lighting and, and, you know, rather rarely, I think, we're in on the ground floor with, uh, you know, with uh, a, a political authority that is, is welcoming these kinds of thoughts and interventions. Okay. Questions? Yes. City as theater, but all of you seem to have reversed it. The the, um, the theater as city of bringing the public into it. So I was wondering, am I picking up that correctly? Could you comment? <laughs> well, I I, mean, I don't know. I'm not really sure how. Um, uh, you know, I think that of, of late we've been doing more and more architecture. We've had an opportunity to do um, new cultural institutions and transform old ones. And um, more and more one has to think about the relationship between the cultural institution and the city and the potential interface between um, some semi-private space and, and public space and um, how to produce um, interesting spaces where the relationship between performer and perform can, can change, can, uh, can flip, um, and where um, the unticketed audience can also uh, uh, get, take benefit of the institution. And so that, that is a kind of a place, that, that, that edge, that interface is a kind of very um, kind of sweet spot that I think a lot of architects and, and uh, performers and creative people around the theater are interested in mm -hmm. kind of exceeding and breaking the walls of the institution. And do you think, in, I mean, in terms of your dialogue with clients, are they, are they interested, you know, I think as architects we have so much more that we can add to, to this kind of process than just delivering drawings and, you know, checking how things get put together on site. Have you felt your role shifting at all through these processes uh, in some of these projects that you're describing? I mean, I'm thinking of the Ground Zero one. Was, was that your initiative? Yeah, yes, it was. Um, actually, there was, there, there was a project that I had hoped to show, and I, I ran out of time, but um, where we really kind of tested the agency of the architect um, and, and went much further than, uh, than we thought that we could. And this was with our colleagues, uh, uh, David Rockwell. Um, and we, um, there was an RFP uh, in the city for the use of a, a small site, about 21,000 square feet, just off the High Line in a new development, uh, Hudson Yards development, where um, there was an opportunity to really think out of the box, well, what, what does the city need? Or what can the city do that it isn't currently doing rel relative to the cultural institution? We put on the table um, a transformable building, a building that actually moves and changes its footprint uh, to produce, kind of to double its size when it needs to in, into public open space, uh, to be able to be financially self-sustainable. And, and this was like a very important thing that really came out of um, you know, this, this financial era where we were really trying to think of, um, you know, can the architect come up with a new idea, a new paradigm that would actually solve part of the problem that it's very difficult to build new institutions, there's not that much money uh, for them, but then you spend all your money kind of making these new institutions, there's no money left for um, programming them. And so the thought was, can the new institution kind of um, find a, a line between income generation and absorption of income, so performance, curatorial um, uh, freedom, and also the production of money to be able to do more. And so this was this a project that we got the city very uh, involved in, and it's happening. Mm -hmm. And how, so how are you making the money from that project? Uh, well, the, we're, um, by, by doubling it, its footprint, it's literally, uh, it's called the culture shed, and the shed moves on a track. And um, by, by expanding this, we can uh, host events like um, art fairs and fashion week 
Um, and so income generating, literally income generating events, um, even galas, without disturbing the, uh, the cultural institution itself just by expanding, or, and also being, being able to take super large exhibitions and performances. So um, it, it, it's, it happens to be at that kind of, it's a fantastic opportunity because there's space there to be able to rethink um, the, the limitation of just m making a theater, charging admission, and then, um, so I think this you know, comes out of a kind of more uh, polluted idea about what that culture may be, um, you know, is not so, pu it's not so pure. These days one has to raise money anyway so why not allow the, um, the, the, the venue itself to perform in multiple ways? Mm -hmm. I, I think your question about theater as city and city as theater and those inversions is productive. Um, I can, I'd like to share um, that oftentimes with choreography, without thinking, I mean civically one could think about traffic or traffic patterns choreographically as, as well. But what I find interesting is the question of authorship um, these days for choreography inside of theater. And how, is it a single author or is there a, um, is, is there one author and then dance is commonly uh, shared or practiced communally in groups or in the street or at clubs or groups on stage or um, dance class or, or these kinds of things. So I think, uh, your, your question in a way for dance and choreography becomes about who is designing the event and its, and its space. Other questions? Okay, I'm gonna take one prerogative then. I, I think uh, a lesson I learned from all of you uh, today was the importance of constraint for creativity, innovation, and in some ways freedom, and I think it's it's a lesson that doesn't get extended enough outside of sort of the world of, of creative artistic production in part. Um, if you think of like economic logics of activity, the idea of a constraint is something that, that limits markets, that puts restrictions, that, that should always be fought against. And I think it was really one of the powerful lessons I think I took away from all of you today was that we should, we should think of constraints, um, which, which might be on markets or all kinds of <coughs> institutions, as potentially the very conditions for creativity, innovation, uh, the development of ideas, rather than the thing that, that limits us. And so I, I, I thank you for this, for, for, for this insight. <laughs> um, I think we're also quite tired. Uh, many of us have been here uh, since about 9.30 this morning. I'd like to then take the opportunity to thank the organizers who did a truly tremendous job. <laughs> And, and finally, I, I'd like to, to thank the audience and um, in, in the spirit of the last presentation, encourage you to, uh, to, to actually build upon these lessons with us. So um, you can follow uh, or, or, or track us. And Saskia, maybe you would like a, a final word. Thank you. I, I, 